Genesis 22, verse 1 through 3. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. That's a bold ask. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place for which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. Say worship. worship. Very important. And we will come back to you. Verse 9. Drop down to verse 9. Then they came to the place for which, of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. Very, very interesting. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. Look at the consistency in his response to God. In the midst of all of this pressure, he still responds to God the same way. Verse 12. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I want to teach, uh, I want to give you a key. I want to give you a life key today called Isaac Moments. Say Isaac Moments. Isaac. And I'm talking about sacrifice. Look at somebody and say, what is your Isaac? What is your Isaac? Do you have an Isaac? Yeah. Father, we thank you for the word. God, please give me a nimble mind and an agile tongue to communicate your truths so that our lives may be transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Do you have an Isaac? I want to lay a foundation. If you have not been with us um, in the start of this series, uh, keys. Say keys. And, 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 and people understand that keys represent different things in life. Amen. And so I want to make sure that we have the keys to properly function in life. And so the purpose of this series that we're in is to move you to move you past a place of frustration to a place of fulfillment. Amen. God's desire for your life is that you walk and live a fulfilled life that in everything that you're doing, you feel some type of replenishment from it. You were created to be fulfilled. And so frustration is usually an indication that there is development that needs to take place or a movement that needs to take place. But frustration should never be a permanent season in your life. Amen. God designed you to live more in fulfillment than frustration. The other part of this series that's that's the purpose of this series, is that we move you past a point of failure into a place of your future. We want to move you past this cycle of ah, almost, almost. Anybody ever been there before? Where it's like, ah, I had a goal. I had a certain amount that I wanted to save. I had a certain amount of debt that I wanted to pay. I had a certain amount of things that I wanted to do during the week. I had a certain amount of relationships. I had a certain amount of books that I wanted to read, but I just fell just, 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 just short of it. And so now the goal is how do we move into our future where the goals that we set, the things that we set, we actually accomplish them. And so we want to talk about that. And so principles also, like when we're talking about keys, we're talking about principles. We're talking about principles. Like life is governed by principles. There is a principle that governs your car. 
And if you violate those principles, you will not, you will not benefit from what your car was created or designed to do for you. There is a principle of gasoline. Amen. So if you violate the principle of gasoline and go, you know, I got a whole bunch of orange juice. I got apple juice in the in the in the kitchen. Let me put that in my car instead. Once you do that, your car will no longer operate the way it was designed to because you have went against the principle. Amen. Red light is a principle. If you violate it, you will suffer the consequences. And so what happens is God's promises God's promises have the blessing built into it. Right. And at the same time, what happens is when we violate or go against a principle, the punishment is automatically attached to it. So if you play with fire, you don't play with fire today. And then two weeks later, there's a knock on your door like, hey, this is fire. Two weeks ago, you were playing with me. Yeah, I'm here to burn you. (laughs) Amen. It automatically. It's not like the red light cameras. In a popka. <sighs> I was like, I was switching lanes. It's like, sorry, you still gotta pay it. But you know, red light camera, you run it, you think you got away, and then you get that letter in the mail. It's not like that with principles. So God is saying is, is once you understand the principles, you can you can benefit from its function. It's automatically built into it for you, right? And so principles guarantee success. They work everywhere. They work for everyone. They work anytime. They work in every situation, which means principles don't change. Principles don't change. You can't get on the roof and go, I bind you gravity in the name of Jesus. It don't change. You and Jesus going to meet real soon. So which means in order for them to work, we have to change. And they automatically work for us. They don't change. And also, last one point is principles are keys, which means keys represent authority. Keys represent access. You have authority over your car because you have the keys. You have authority over your house because you have the keys. There's things you have access to. And you know, the problem, the sad reality is one of the reasons that we are striving with you is because God has left keys for you and I to operate and govern life, but we choose to operate in a limited capacity. You have access to things that has been paid for, that has been reserved for you, but you choose not to operate with those keys. Amen? And so Satan's entire job is to distract you from the keys. He don't want you to get the keys because if you get the keys, you have access. If you get the keys, now authority is released to you. Jesus said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And so our goal is to give you a key today. And it's found in Genesis 22. Now, as I spend more time in the word of God, I I realize that there are different ways to gain experience. And, And experiences in life can also serve as keys. Right. You there's certain things that you go through. You learn, Okay, don't do that anymore. And you pass that down as a lesson to your children, to your friends. You go, listen, if if fool me once, shame on me, shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on who? Me. What? That's a key. Why? Because you're saying I should have known the first time that it happened. So that's an experience that we now say, you know what, I'm going to put this in my ring. Amen. So when I look in the Bible, when we read the Bible, there are different avenues by way God allows experiences to come into our lives because experiences will serve as keys for you. And so I want to give you some Um, some experiences in the Bible that you can say, okay, now when you go through there, you know what kind of experience that you're essentially going to acquire, what kind of key you're going to acquire. The first thing is when you look through the Bible, one avenue by which you gain experience is through temptation. Say temptation. temptation. Write it down, temptation. Temptation is one of the avenues by which you gain experience in the Bible. Now, the thing about temptation is the experience that you will be learning is not about you as much as it is about the enemy and what he has on you. 
So when you're in temptation, temptation serves as a point for you to understand your adversary. Based on what he tempts you with, let you know what information he has on you. If you are going to, if you are going to court, based on the witness that they bring out, we'll let you know, oh, okay, yeah, he don't know nothing. Right? Or she doesn't know anything. But if they bring a certain witness out, you're like, oh, it's over. It's over. So, so, so when temptation comes into our lives, it's an opportunity for, for us to go, okay, so this would, so this, how you going to come at me? So this is what you think of me, Satan? He's not omnipresent. He's not omni. He doesn't know everything. So he has to tempt you based on the information that he has. And so what he usually does is he studies your family line. He studies your family line and go, OK, that got their grandfather. That got their grandmother. That, OK, they're short tempered in their family. So he tempts with that. Right. And so you can see what he has on you through temptation. Now, also write this down. This is very important. Temptation is a desire that is designed to destroy you. Temptation is a desire that he feeds you this desire with the attempt to destroy you. So he tempts you with something that you wouldn't mind having, but the goal is to destroy you. That's why temptation is so hard. Why? Because I desire it. But on the back end is destruction. So that's one experience we learn. And a lot of us, amen, we fall in, but after a while, you go, nah, you ain't going to fool me this time. I, I, I see it. I see it. Now nah, you're not going to get me with this one. And he just upgrades, he upgrades the temptation. Number two, trials and tribulations by which we gain experience. Trials and tribulations. We gain experience through trials. Trials is an opportunity for us to learn about ourselves, where we learn what we're made of. When the heat is on, when the pressure is on, do we break? There's this famous quote we say in basketball, right? When, when the team you had down, we start coming back, now the score is tied up, we're not playing. We, uh, next score win, what? Pressure, bust, pipes. Trials allows that pressure so you can see where's your breaking point. It's an opportunity. It's a key. So you know, man, every time I find myself limited in resource, I begin to shut down. That's an opportunity for, to, for you to learn about yourself so you can know how to overcome that. Like, okay, so next time I'm going to put some things in place so when I start feeling this way, I have an outlet, I have an avenue. Number three. Very important key, testing, testing, testing. We gain experience through testing. We gain experience through temptations. We gain experience through trials. We gain experience through testing. This is where we learn about God. This is where we learn about God based on how he processes us, based on how he, he, he forms and fashions us for his glory. So testing... We gain experience through tests when we learn about God. And here's the thing. There is no testimony without a test. Like you have to go through a test. Now, let me back it up by scripture. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse four says, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who what? Test our hearts. God tests Satan tempts. Satan, Satan tempts. God tests. God does not tempt us. Satan does. So if you're being tempted with like, you know, you walk by a million dollars on the floor, you'd be like, oh, God, is oh, God, no. <laughs> is this a test or is this a blessing? A lot of times we go through certain th things and, and it's really a test and we fail it. We fail it. And we got to go take the test again. Amen. And it's one of those things where they'll just let you keep taking the test until you pass it. So this is an opportunity for us to gain the experience. Now, John James, chapter one, verse three says, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience. Job 23 says, but he had he knows the way that I go, that I take. 
When he has tested me, I shall come forth as what? Pure gold. And then the Bible says, now, now it came to pass after these things that God, what? He didn't tempt. He didn't try. He tested Abraham. You have something that I need to test its authenticity. And anyone here will go through that process. And only God would ask for something back that he gave, that he promised. It's like, why? See, it's easy, it's easy when God asks for Lot. It's easy for Lot to go, step, step away from Lot. All right, cool. Lot meant veil. He was leeching off of me anyway. He got rich off of me anyway. So bye, Lot. Right? It's easy to cut people off that we, you know, like, all right, we're done with that. So Lot is easy to cut off. It's easy to cut off Ishmael. Ishmael represents the flesh. Ishmael is the decision that we made in our impatience. So Ishmael represents the choices that I didn't wait for. So it's easy to separate from Ishmael, to separate from Hagar. But can you give up Isaac? Isaac is what you prayed for. Isaac is what you sacrificed for. Isaac is what you cried and fasted for. Isaac is what you skipped a meal for. Six to six, 12 to 12. Daniel fast. Isaac is what you gave your first fruits for. For anybody who knows what first fruits is at the top of the year, first fruits is I'm going to give God a full paycheck. You know, that's what first fruit means. So if you hear that term, first fruit, someone, it's a step of faith financially, like, God, I'm going to trust you with a full. Okay, we'll teach it down the road, right? It's a faith move in your finances. So Isaac is what you said. Can you give God what you've been waiting for? What you've been praying for? What you've poured your energy into? Everything that is, 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 is concerning Abraham is locked up in Isaac. Isaac is his future. Isaac has everything that he wants. And God asked for Isaac. Now, the thing that would be hard to give or make changes for may qualify as an Isaac in your life. I don't know what Isaacs you have, but the thing that you, if God came and asked you for it, that you would have difficulty letting it go, that may be an Isaac in your life. And one of the keys is understanding in life when you're having these moments with God where he requires Isaac. And I'm here to tell you, we have more than one Isaac in our life. If we'll be honest, we got a bunch of Isaacs. Because along the way, there's things that we believe God for, and he answers it, and we acquire it, and we love it, and we nurture it. But occasionally, God will come and say, I want Isaac. What are you going to do about that? See, the biggest Isaac in our life is our choice, is our will, is our ability to choose. That's an Isaac in our life. Like, we have a choice. And God is saying, God wants you to choose him over your own self-interest and convenience. Can you choose what God wants even if it hurts you? Can you give him what he wants even if it will cost you everything? Okay. See, most of us, we understand the story. We go, yeah, God, here's Isaac, because, okay, the blessing's coming. We read the story. He doesn't have the Bible. Are you serious? I just waited for him. All these years, I almost got killed. I shifted different places. Certain things changed, in my, and you want, excuse me? Anybody ever talk to God like that? Like, re really? I'm being audited? I got to pay another fee? They, they found something in my body? Are you serious? Like, what more can I do? I want Isaac. So, I want to give you a list real quick. Choosing to obey God will do a few things. Number one, choosing to obey God will inconvenience you. It is not easy obeying God. Because he says in Isaiah 55, he's like, my, my ways are not your ways. My thought, I don't even think on your level. You don't even think on mine. So when he asks for things, our minds go, why? <laughs> like, help me understand. I'm one that go, okay, Tell me where you're taking me, what challenges I'll face along the way, and I'll decide if I want to sign up. <laughs> Am I the only one? And so God's like, no, I'm not going to do that. So it will inconvenience you. Number two, it will alter and change your relationships. Obeying God will alter and change your relationships. 
But listen to me. Listen to me. Be more confident in fitting in with God than fitting in with people. It's better to fit in with God and fall out with people than fall out with God and fit in Mm -hmm. with people. It is better if God stays in your life. Like I beg you, whatever transitions you go through in your life, don't lose God. Amen? Because if you have God, people will come around. Amen? But you're not guaranteed that God will come around if you, if you pick people over him. So whatever it is that you're going through in life, pick God over the career. Pick God over this, over the business. Pick God. Why? Because if you have God, all of it can be replaced. Amen? And so it will change your relationships. Number three, it will require everything you have. Obeying God will require everything you have. But here's what happens when you do. Here's the results. Number one, transformation. Transformation. Hanging with God changes your thinking, changes your confidence. You know, like, like you can say, like, people who hang out with people who like to fight and can't fight, eventually, they feel like they can fight too. <laughs> right? Because, like, whatever's on them gets on you. Like, man, what? Cause, and you know you got back up. <laughs> you know, just... <laughs> Let's put that out there. You got back up. Boy, I'll get my brother. What? So, so it transformed you. Hanging out with God will transform you. It'll change your thinking. You started thinking like, you know what? I wanted to get this. I'm just looking for a $5,000 car. And you start hanging out with God. Be like, yeah, I'm here um, for the $50,000 one. I just want to start this business from my house. And you go, no, I'm looking for an office space. Right? Hanging out with God will transform you. OK, number two, it'll, 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 it'll elevate or your relationships will be of higher quality and purpose. Amen. Can you imagine friends who hear your dreams and go, can I invest in it? How much you need to start? Amen. We need more friends like that. Raise your hand real quick. Say, Lord, give me friends that can invest in my dream. Cash in Jesus name. Amen. Put your hands down. Higher quality. You're like, what? What you want to do? I, I want to. I, let me get in on that. Hanging out with God will elevate the quality of your relationships and it'll be, it'll be about purpose. And number three, hanging out with God will also give you unlimited supply. Say unlimited supply. Unlimited supply. All right. So watch this now. The promise. Let's say my left hand is the promise is, is, is me or you waiting. Right. So. So in order to get the promise, let's say this book is the promise. You had to be patient. Say patience. So in order to get a promise from God, a lot of times the Bible says his promises are yes and amen. So a lot of times it's you're just not ready. Just wait. Right. There's things you believe in God for. It's like he said, I am going to do it. Just not right now. So you got to wait. So the promise that you're waiting from God. So this is the promise. This is you. You got to be patient. So patience is what's required to get the promise. You with me so far? So in order to get the promise from God, I just got to be patient and just trust he knows what he's doing. So, so, so in order for me to get the promise, I need to be patient. I, I, I want to drive this in your head for a second because I want you to understand where I'm going. So in order for me to get the promise, I got to be patient. So The promise requires patience. 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 patience. Are you with me so far? All right, so my right hand is the blessing. Okay? My right hand is blessing. The blessing requires the promise. The blessing requires the promise. The promise requires patience. I was patient. I have the promise. But in order to get the blessing, I got to turn over the promise. That's Isaac. Abraham was patient and he got the promise. And God says, I want the promise back. Why? Because back here, I'm planning to bless you, but I can't tell you. Because it's a test. 
teachers don't talk during the test. And he allowed him to go on a three-day journey to see what he does. So in order to get the blessing, God needs to know, will you fork over the promise? Now, mind you, the promise is what you ask for. You ask God, God, you know what? I'm believing by faith. I make over $10,000 a month. That You patiently work. You diligently work for it. And now you're living in the promise, driving in the promise, walking in the promise. And God's like, I need the whole thing. You're like, I don't need anything else. I'm good. Like, I'm good. Like, I'm good. Like, seriously, I don't need anything. I'm good. And he's like, no, I know you're good, but I want the promise. Why? I can't tell you. And that's where we struggle with. Because we think it ends with the promise. And God's like, I got a bigger plan. I got a plan. Like, you was just, you was just, see my reflexes? You was just. You was just stewarding the promise. I got bigger plans for you. And somebody needs to hear that. You don't need anything. And God's demanding everything from you. Like, I really don't need anything. Why? Because he has bigger plans for you. The promise that you were asking for is only for you. I need you to do something for me that involves more than you. Right? And so... He says this, write this down. Any Isaac that we are unwilling to sacrifice will eventually be an idol in our lives. So so you waited for the promise. Oh, man, I got Isaac. I got Isaac. Now, God says, I want Isaac. If we don't turn Isaac over, the thing that he promised us, that he blessed us with, that we now have in our possession is now an idol. And now is coming between you and God. I'm gonna give, give you some keys at the end to really help us move forward in our walk with God. And he says this, me and the lad are going to worship, which means worship is a place where we meet the creator. That's why they can't find Eden. Eden was an atmosphere. Worship is an atmosphere, right? And then it also says that he set the wood in order which means there's an order to worship, right? There's an order. Now, when I say order, religious minds will go, oh, that's religion. That's religion. But in reality, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a reverence order. Come before his gates with thanksgiving. Come before his courts with, there's a way you come to God. He's a king. And so there's an order to it. It's that I'm acknowledging that God, I'm I'm thanking you. You know what, God? Before I even ask for anything new, let me thank you for the old things. Thank you that my car still works. I would like a new one, but thank you that the car still works. Thank you that my house has kept us safe. I desire a new one, but thank you. Let me go ahead and turn around real quick and thank you for what you have done before I even ask you to do another thing. There's an order to worship. And he says, me and the lad are going to worship. Wait a minute. You're going to sacrifice your son. So which means Abraham calls sacrifice worship. So real worship is sacrifice. See, God inhabits in praise of the people. But he looks and seeks who's going to worship in spirit and truth. See, see, praise is for the crowds. Praise, like praise is for, it's for the public, but worship is for private. Praise is for the crowds, but worship is for close up. See, see, when we sing and we come and we sing songs and we play songs, that's not worship. Songs and singing is a result of worship. Amen? So what happens is we get so close to God. We get so close to God and we hear his heartbeat, and from the heartbeat, we pin a song. From the heartbeat, we, 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 we pin a sermon. From a, his heartbeat, we start a business. From, from worship, from intimacy with him, we get, we, oh, oh, we start something new for him, because this is his heartbeat. That's why the Bible says, delight yourself. 
where he's your desire. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Because if you get so close to God, his heartbeat becomes your heartbeat. And when he sees your heartbeat, his heartbeat and your heartbeat, he gives you your heartbeat, but he's really giving you his heartbeat. You start spending time with God. You say, man, I have a heart to see these children go to school. You know what, God? I'm going to start a business, and I'm going to give 25% of my business to send these kids to a scholarship. No, that came from worship and intimacy. Why? God has a plan for one of those kids, and it became your heartbeat. You really you got in sync with his heartbeat, and you picked it up, and then he saw it in you, and then he blessed it. That's worship. Worship is a sacrifice. It's going to cost something when we worship. Worship is sacrifice. True worship is given of ourselves and all that is attached to us. That's worship. Abraham called the process worship. Sacrifice means something's getting killed. Something's going to die. That's what sacrifice means. So what happens is we know we have truly worship when we leave with something killed within us that God can be glorified. Crown Church, hear me. It doesn't matter how big we get, if we don't leave with something in us that got killed, we did not worship. If we leave more segregated, we did not worship. If we leave more unforgiving, we did not worship. If we leave more prideful, more haughty, we did not worship. It doesn't matter. Like if we're regressing, we're not killing anything, which means every time we come, we're not coming to be entertained. You're not coming for the worship team to lead you and all that stuff. We're coming together. The worship team is just initiating what we should have been doing together. We're bringing the sacrifice to God. And then we get in this moment and we get in this space and we are worshiping. Amen. See, true worship is the process of sacrificing anything in our lives that would prevent the spirit of God from executing his will through our lives. So there's something in my life blocking God from flowing through my life. I got to bring that to kill it. That's worship. God, I noticed that I noticed that my pride is blocking. So this Sunday, I'm bringing my pride to the altar and I'm worshiping. I got to kill this pride. I got to kill this unforgiveness. I got to kill this thing that's blocking. That's worship. Sacrifice is not something we do, but rather something that we are. See, worship is not coming to get from God. Worshiping is coming to give God what he requires. That's why every morning you should, every morning, good morning, God, what do you want me to do? What will you have me to do today? Good morning, God. I live for you. I got plans, I got goals, but what do you want me? Like, how can my steps please you this morning? That's worship. God, this business that you blessed me with, God, you gave me 500 employees and millions of dollars. What, what do you want me to do with it? What do you want me to do with it? What are we living for? Like, we're asking him for things that has nothing to do with him but really for us. And he has no problem giving you anything if you allow him to be a part of it. God, what do you want to do with my marriage? What do you want to do? God, these are your children. These are your children. <laughs> Please give me wisdom, Lord, so I can raise this one the way you want him raised and raise this one the way you want her raised. Give me wisdom. Because these are your children. Worship. Worship. Can we go a little bit further? Isaac is a foreshadow of Jesus, which means as the sacrifice, he did not, he did not fight nor complain, but he trusted that his father knew what he was doing. What do you do when you have no options? What, what, what do you do if we laid you on the wood? Uh, what you doing? Like, did he really say me? Like, me. Like, you sure it wasn't like some sheep or a cow that you named Isaac? Me. He wants, he wants you to kill me? What do you do when you're out of options? What do you do when you don't have any choice, when you're bound, when you're restricted? What do you do when they're talking about you? 
What do you do when it seems like everyone is against you? Isaac didn't respond. He trusted his father. Jesus didn't respond. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. What do you do? Are you responding? See, everyone wants to be blessed, but no one wants to suffer. Everyone wants the prize, but no one wants to pay the price for it. Everyone wants to be a success, but no one wants to sacrifice. Everyone wants fruit, but no one wants to plant or plow. Amen? And so let me show you something. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, but, as, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have what? Suffered a while. Here's what suffering does. It perfects, it establishes, it strengthens, and it settles you. So, 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 so God, God coming for Isaac is suffering. Like, I got I to gotta emotionally, for three days, Abraham's walking to bring him to where God, and he's emotionally detaching himself from his son so he can give God what he wants. That's suffering. That's suffering. And the Bible says we're going to suffer, but what happens is it's to perfect some things. It's to settle some things. It's to establish some things in us. God wants your Isaac. Here's my question. Are you willing to sacrifice the promise for the blessing? Are you willing to sacrifice the promise for the blessing? Yeah. See, Isaac is not just the things you like. For some of us, Isaac are the things that we can't separate from. It doesn't necessarily mean they're beneficial from it, for us. Isaac can be an addiction. Isaac can be an emotional attachment. Isaac can be something that we struggle. Like if God came for it, we would struggle to let it go. That's an Isaac. God, I, I, don't, I don't, like all I know, I grew up, all we did was fight. We're a very combative family. So I don't know how to resolve through communication. We just fight. That's an Isaac. Like, I don't know how to overcome this low point in my life without some type of substance to assist me to get through this period. That's an Isaac. And God is saying, I want your Isaac. I want your Isaac. I don't know how to let go of this anger. I don't know how to let go of this frustration. I don't know how to let go of this hurt. That's an Isaac. That's an Isaac. And we got to be willing to give God Isaac. Why? Because Isaac is all we've known. Isaac is all we've waited for. All I know is this way of life. All I know is how to make decisions like this. All I know is how to think this way. Once I give it to you, what do I have? And God's saying, trust me. Trust me. Hmm. Let me give you this real quick. Back to temptation, back to trials and testing. Here's some further revelation in it. Spending time with God. God speaks to me in the shower. So like, I gotta quickly jump out of the shower and like run to a notepad real quick. Don't get the visual, amen. <laughs> I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus, right? So, so um, the, when, when we finally build our house, amen, after we build God a house, after we get the people of God settled in their home and we get to build ours, I'm going to put a recorder in the shower, you know. All right, cool. <laughs> Some of you guys have notepads by your bed. You wake up in a dream, you got to write it and all that stuff, right? I'm telling you, God's speaking to you guys, but you don't write it down. He give you an idea and be like, oh, somebody's already doing it. And then 10 years later, somebody do it, and you had it 10 years ago. Okay? Listen, God is always speaking, so don't take it lightly. You're like, what? Okay, let me write this down. It sounds crazy, but I'll just write it down. Okay, so revelation and temptation. Temptation is for compromise. Temptation is for compromise. Your adversary comes to cause you to compromise. That's why he brings temptation into your life. That's why he brings it into my life. He wants us to compromise. Why? So we can therefore disqualify ourselves. Disqualify ourselves. 
That's why temptation comes into life. See? So, so when you get ready to do something, you're flooded with shame and guilt. He's like, you have to know your adversary. Why? Because they're like, oh, man, I can't say I was just, I can't. That's the enemy. Temptation comes for compromise, to disqualify you. Trials come to construct you. Trials come to construct you. That's why you're going through what you're going through. God is developing you. First one is disqualify. Second one is development. Yes, the third one is a third D as well, just so you can remember it. But testing is for confirmation. So, which means God tests you because something's already in you that he put in you. Now I got to test it to confirm it. Job says, after he has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. So if you're fighting testing, you're fighting confirmation. Because once it gets confirmed, now he can, okay, number one, what? I'm a teacher. I love to teach. Number one, he disqualifies. Satan disqualifies. Number two, trials develop. But God, God wants to confirm so he can distinguish you. So he can go, look, this is mine. You are mine. I confirmed it. This one's mine. He said to Jesus, this is what? My son, who I'm well pleased. And in John 15, it says, if you have potential to bear fruit, God cuts you so you can bear more fruit. Why? He want to distinguish you. He want to distinguish you. Like, listen, um, anyone in here that, that has a problem with being blessed by God, you're going to have a big problem because he has this thing where he blesses and then he blesses again. And then he blesses again and, and your haters be like, dang. How many cars do they need? How many houses do they need? It's not you. It's God blessing you. Why? Because he's well pleased with you. And he knows if he asks for it, you'll give it up. So he does it to show off in your life, to show off in your life. And I'm here to tell you, please give God a platform to show off in your life. If you want God to bless you, give him something to bless. God, please bless me financially. Give him something to bless. Start a business. Like, he has no avenue to bless you. I remember I was like, God, please bless me. I was in church. Oh, God, please bless me. He said, give me something to bless. I was just working. So either you believe me for a promotion or you believe me for other streams of income. You see what I'm saying? So I'm here. Like, if you want God to bless you, give him something to bless. Start a business. Find a problem in your job and solve it and ask for a promotion. Ask for a pay raise. Amen. I was reading an article. They just settled. Disney workers are now minimum wage is fifteen dollars an hour. That is a pay. That's what? And what they gonna do? They gonna upgrade the house. They gonna upgrade the car. They gonna lose the raise. <laughs> they just gonna upgrade. Higher car payments. Higher house. Everything. Like you didn't get a raise. You're still paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> Stay on the bottom. We was, we was out to dinner, and we was watching, we was watching cars. I was like, how come they ain't parked my car in the front? <laughs> you know, when you go to restaurants, the valet put the, you know, you see. Like, hold on, I feel some type of way. Like, what's wrong with my Honda? <laughs> like, why got to be the Maserati, right? And I said to my wife, I said, you know what's crazy? All these people are going to live like this for 20 years, and they ain't got nothing saved up. And I said, the guy that's pushing the Toyota going to buy their house at a discount, buy their Maserati with a little bit more miles on it at a discount, right? And so we'll teach this down the road. Live below your means so you can do it. Like, live below your means so you can enjoy life. You should be living on 70%. Amen? You should be living on 70%. So, all right, let's rush through this. Temptation has a minimal to no upfront price, but will cost you everything on the back end. Temptation requires you to give nothing up front, but you will lose everything in the end. Temptation has little to no price to buy in, but will cost you everything to cash out. Okay? Now, when it comes to God, we can't afford the upfront price. This is why I love Jesus, because Jesus paid the upfront price. Amen? But he leaves the cost up to you. He didn't say count the price, he says count the cost. 
So we have to count the cost when it comes to that. And so this is why we struggle in our relationship with God. We're still holding on to everything. And so what happened is Isaac is our everything and everything is our Isaac. Now, I was there. I was on a little three-week sabbatical. I was there. You were my Isaac. You were my Isaac, if I'll be transparent. Like, I labored for you. Didn't know if you would come. Prayed for you. Took 20 pounds off for you. You can tell. I look good, right? I feel good, too. Pants nice and everything. Gave all my big clothes away. I'm like, I ain't never going back. You were my Isaac. You were my Isaac. I mean, stay home, thought about it. Read everything. You were my Isaac. And God says, I want your Isaac. What? And I'm like, why? He said, because Crown Church is more in my hands than in your hands will ever be. But what, what, if, what, if, what if this happens or that happens and this happens and that happens? He says, it doesn't matter. Trust me. Trust me anyway. And I'm saying that. I'm setting you up because, Crown, there's some demands that God is putting on us. Amen? This can't stay in this room. This type of ministry, this type of word, this type of culture can't stay in this room. Amen. Amen? So I got to bring you to the altar and be ready to kill everything to please him. Amen? And trust that he knows what he's doing, regardless of what happened. And so the reason I'm saying that is when we can come together and sacrifice together, right? That way our neighbor, our family, our friends, can come in contact with this relational God, we can win our city back. Because what happens is people are losing hope in God. They don't believe that he answers prayers anymore. They don't believe, they believe that you got to just go grind 80 hours, 120 hours a week to look blessed. They don't believe that you can do it on less than 40. They don't believe that you can, can love your family and raise your family right and be bound. They don't believe that. So God is saying, I need, I need representation to prove that, look, you're driving what I'm driving, living what I'm living, but I got peace. Amen. Amen? I got joy. I'm not connected to this thing. I will walk away from it. And they're going to go, how do you live that way? How do you live? You ready to give it all up? Yeah, I'll give it all up. Why? Because God provides. God needs representation. So I had to bring Isaac to the table. And he challenged me. Just obey my voice. Crown Church is more in God's hands. And then he reminded me, these past few weeks, I just was thinking and praying and reading. And he says, what is your assignment? Put it up. Put up. That's our assignment. Transforming followers into leaders. Transforming is a process. Metamorphosis is the word, right? Metamorphosis. So which means the caterpillar, the butterfly will never be the caterpillar again. I'm not talking about Superman, change, Clark Kent. No, that's changing. I said transforming. Which means they look at you and go, nah, not you. Why? You're a completely different person. All right, let me back it up by scripture. He that is in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything is new. I can't even recognize you anymore. The way you love, the way you are so nice and compassionate. Amen? I met some members earlier, tough, rough. I said, don't worry, I'm going to break you down. Right? Oh, man, I'll hug. All right, come here. How you doing, man? Now, what they do at the after service, they look for the hug. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm going to change. We're going to transform you. Right? Because all of us have the capacity to love like this, but our experiences make us wall up. So I'm going to believe the God in you, and we're going to get it out of you. Transform it. And then followers into leaders, which means once God transforms you, he now holds you to a different standard because you're no longer in the back. You're in the front. You set the tone, which means he holds you to a standard. Transforming followers and leaders. Leadership is about movement. Leadership is about movement. And so what that means is Crown Church is a place for all people, for all people who don't mind movement. 
that's the one thing. Like, my default problem as a person is I love too hard. That's my problem. Like, I love too hard. Because God has invested so much in my personal life, and he just fights with me. And I pass that on to people. Sometimes it scares them, if we'll be honest. Because sometimes I believe more for you than you believe for yourself. Like, why are you settling for less when God has so much more? That's my default. I'm working on it. Amen? But that's what I believe. Like, everyone to me is a leader. Everyone to me has greatness on the inside of them. Even if they don't want it, I just see that. And you have to look at people that way, too. That guy that we passed by on the bridge, there's greatness in them. Why not? That's a billionaire under the bridge. God put something in that person. I don't believe it's reserved for just a few. I believe everyone who wants it, the Bible calls him that with God, all things are possible. So if I come to God, if you come to God, why not? But I got a record. I got a background. Why not? Amen? Amen. So we got to see that in people. And when we start doing that, we can start changing our culture and our environment. We set the terms now. We don't like the way school is going. We're going to put our money together and we're going to build the school and teach the right precepts. That's where we're going. That's what we set the tone. The world comes here and says, how do you teach this generation? How is it that your youth are buying homes before they even graduate college or high school? How is it that they're doing that? Why? Because we have a standard that God has taught us. That's where we're going. Amen? Buckle up. We're going there. It's convincing followers that they're actually leaders. It's convincing slaves, you're not a slave, you're a son. It's convincing people who are far from God that you don't have to be far from him anymore. You can be near to him. That's a hard assignment. Why? Because religion has done so much damage. Religion has done so much damage. Where whenever, like I don't even tell people I'm a pastor. I don't. I invite them to church and everything. They show up and they're, whoop, I'm preaching. Because if I say I'm a pastor, oh, no, 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 religion. So I got to be creative. Uh, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm, a, I'm a purpose coach. <laughs> Airplane conversation. So what do you do? I'm a purpose coach. You know, I'm a, I'm a trainer. I'm a, I'm a builder. I work in import and export. I export negative thinking and import the word of God. <laughs> Amen. Whatever. Listen, Paul said, I become all things to men that Christ may begin. Like whatever I got to do to make it work, I'm going to spin it. <laughs> like I meet somebody, about, oh, I don't believe in church. You know what? I don't believe in, I don't believe in that religion too. Man, that religion stuff. That religion stuff. Man, religion almost cost me my relationship. Every time I say that, they go, I say religion almost, I wrote a paper in college about that. I said, religion almost cost me my relationship with God. I wrote a paper about that. And the reality of it, religion is costing a lot of people their relationship with God. So we're going to fight. I'm going to annoy you. Why? Because I believe too much in you. Now, leaders around us are falling every day for lack of character and accountability. And God will test you for both before he blesses you abundantly. God is ready. He says to Abraham, and I'm closing. Now I know. Now I know you won't hold anything from me. You know what? In blessing, I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply you. Why? Now I know. And I'm telling you right now, God is trying to get you to a now I know moment. You feel it in your spirit where you go, there's a detachment. Some of you guys have been there before. Some of you guys have crossed that threshold where you've lost everything and you've detached from it. You go, I don't care. I got God. And God's like, now I know. And what happens is it starts coming back. 
it starts coming back. And I'm here to prophesy to you. If you're not used to it, it's coming back. Everything that you lost is coming back. Everything that the enemy stole is coming back. Everything, it has to come back. Why? So God can prove himself in your life. It's coming back. I know that you watch the bank account. I know you watch the bank account go down five digits, four, three, two, zero, negative. <laughs> I know you watched it do that, but I'm here to tell you it's coming back. It's coming back and it's not going back down again. It's not going back down. It's coming back back. But God has to know. God has to know. He has to know. All right. God wants to increase you and bless you, but it will require sacrifice. It will require Isaac. Are you ready? Now, here's the key. Here's the life key. I came all this way to give you this key. Here's the key to being blessed. Key to being blessed. Put it up. That's the key to being blessed. Never let your Isaac become your idol. You do that, you'll always be blessed. It sounds basic, but it's real hard. Because you're emotionally wrapped up in Isaac. So emotionally wrapped up in Isaac that you can't see God. So you got to unwrap yourself emotionally away from Isaac. So that whenever God requires it, I can give it. And as long as I keep Isaac close, but not at a distance, then it won't be an idol. It won't be in between me and God. Now, now, now the only way you can be sure of that is you got to be ready to sacrifice it if he asks for it. Sacrifice is the key to give you divine access. This key that I just gave you today of sacrifice opens doors divinely for you. If there's some doors in your life that's locked, sacrifice. It will open it for you. All right. Let me give you what my mentor shared with me. I'm going to give you two things my mentor shared with me about sacrifice, and I'll close. One, sacrifice means giving up something because you value what you are aiming for as better and more value than what, is, what it is that you're giving up. That's sacrifice. I'll give Isaac because whatever I'm giving it up for is better. I don't know what it is, but if God would ask me to give it up, Whatever he's freeing my hands for must be better. You with me? Mm -hmm. But then he balanced it and said this to me. Our motive, however, should not be for the better. Our motive should be because giving it up pleases God. Yeah. So when God asks you for something, oh, more is on the... It shouldn't be about that. God, if this please you, fine. Because when the better comes, as long as it pleases God. And so, how much is Isaac worth to you? How much does Isaac mean to you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we come to you in the name of Jesus. God, we're ready. God, we have a lot of Isaacs in our life. Man, we have a lot of Isaacs. Some of it is what you've promised. Others is what we've emotionally wrapped ourselves into. And so, God, we ask for your grace this morning to help, up, help us give up the Isaacs in our lives so that we can live a life that pleases you. So, God, in this coming week, we ask that you may reveal to us the areas in our lives that we're holding on to that you are asking us to sacrifice. And God, as we sacrifice, we ask that you may respond. We ask that there may be a confirmation to us that are taking the test this week. Let a confirmation take place. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I declare over your people that your grace will allow them to be able to make it through the test. That the voice of the enemy is silenced now. That your body is coming together. That through this house, oh God, we will demonstrate as a people what it is like to trust you and live for you and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, put your hands together if you were blessed by the word. Amen.